Hello to everyone here in Filene and uh, our legions on screen. Welcome, I am Dawn Carey. I serve as Associate Director for Global Health and Development of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. I'm delighted to introduce today's conversation, Pandemics Looking Back to Look Forward. As I love to remind our audiences, we at the center are dedicated to our founder's vision of addressing the great issues of the day. As urged by former Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey, to see the world's problems as our problems, and to see those of us, what those of us here at Dartmouth and beyond can do to address those challenges. Welcome to our Open Chain Family Great Issues Lecture this evening. I want to thank Bill, 62, and Peggy, Open Chain, for their deep support. Bill is a long-standing and revered partner of Dartmouth. And no giggling, no giggling. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say chairs our board of visitors here at the Dickey Center. We also warmly welcome our other board of visitors here in the audience and those zooming in. The consistent goal of this lecture series has always been to animate discussion of a great issue, part of hosting a renowned visitor here on campus. Since 2016, we've had a range of distinguished speakers, including Katie Power, Assistant Power Professor of Government, and Travis Adkins, Georgetown University, and their, their uh, title, How to Build an Anti-Racist Foreign Policy. Anthony Blinken, former Deputy Secretary of State, and today the US Secretary of State. And also former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in conversation with Jake Sullivan, who today serves as the US National Security Advisor. We come together today to both kick off and jump in the middle of a very timely conversation surrounding the lessons of the COVID pandemic. I say kick off because it marks the public introduction of a new undertaking in global health at the Dickey Center, our pandemic security project. Leveraging the strengths that Dartmouth already possesses in its faculty, staff, and high caliber students, this project seeks to convene people and resources to analyze COVID, the vaccine situation, and security challenges, explore where the gaps are there, and help identify national policy recommendations. I say jump in the middle of the conversation because we're also joining a very focused COVID conversation that started more than a year ago. And it's part of an even larger pandemic conversation that's been going on for more than 100 years. In early 2021, four foundations, Smith Futures, the Skoll Foundation, Stand Together, and the Rockefeller Foundation came together to create the COVID Commission Planning Group to form a framework for discussion and action. Based on the design of the 9-11 Commission, this group is led by former 9-11 Commission Director, Philip Zalikow. This planning group is comprised of a large group of supportive advisors from around the United States and beyond. They've mapped the landscape of the crisis, holding listening sessions with over 250 people, and working with scholars at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, the planning group has prepared more than 40 launch work plans already. Both of our speakers today serve on this planning group. Dartmouth and the Dickey Center aim to support inquiry to explore and address these questions that I've discussed and eventually help provide answers for now and the next pandemic. Why here? By its nature, the COVID pandemic requires a multidisciplinary approach and response, as well as work led with stronger links between academics and practitioners in many fields. We deeply believe that Dartmouth can help provide that venue, serve as a source of expertise, and act as a natural convenor for people and institutions leading this response. This conversation begins that work. This afternoon, I'm very pleased to welcome two vanguards to the stage. One, an already well-integrated part of the Dartmouth world, and one here for what I believe is his second visit to the Hanover Plain. <laughs> the focus of this conversation is the power of studying history to make a better future, looking back to look forward. The discussion will be moderated by our own Tori Holt, 
the Norman E. McCulloch Jr., director of the John Sloan Dickey Foundation Center for International Understanding. Our first speaker is Professor Kendall Hoyt, our new faculty director for the Dickey Global Health Initiatives Pandemic Security Project. That 18-month endeavor is put together to explore and analyze the lessons surfaced during the global response to the pandemic. She also serves as assistant professor at the Gaza School of Medicine and a senior lecturer at the Thayer School of Engineering, where she teaches courses on biosecurity, health systems, and technological innovation. Her research is focused on health security, innovation policy, and vaccine development. In addition to serving on the COVID Commission Planning Group, she also serves as a consultant for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and the Nuclear Threat Initiative. She's the author of Long Shot, Vaccines for National Defense. Welcome, Kendall. Our second speaker comes from the warmth of New Orleans, only to be welcomed by snow and bluster, <laughs> a delightful <laughs> element of any day in April in Hanover. Uh, I believe John's last visit was during high school, uh, where he decided that perhaps four years up here might be too cold as well. <laughs> uh, he instead decamped to the southern shores of Providence, Rhode Island, to a little small school down there. <laughs> Celebrated author John Barry came to the work of helping create public policy through the connections that he found in his writing. His bio is replete with incredible examples of how valuable both the literary and science worlds find his voice. He's a New York Times bestseller many times and received multiple book awards throughout his writing career. This includes the New York Public Library naming his Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America, one of the 50 best books in the preceding 50 years, including fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Experts in the field also uh, recognize the power of his work. In 2006, he became the only non-scientist ever to give the National Academy's Abel Woolman Distinguished Lecture, a lecture which honors contributions to water-related science. He was also the only non-scientist on a federal government infectious disease board of experts. He served as a keynote speaker at the White House Conference on the Mississippi Delta and an International Congress on Respiratory Viruses. In addition, he launched a successful lawsuit against 97 oil, gas, and pipeline companies for their role in the destruction of 2,000 square miles of Louisiana's coast. He now serves as distinguished scholar at Tulane's Bywater Institute and a professor at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. All these accolades are a clear indicator of his impact on leading the charge in effective public policy. Last week, Tulane placed an even dearer set of laurels upon his brow. He was inducted to the Tulane Athletic Hall of Fame for being one of the coaches on the 1973 Tulane football team, the school's best team since 1948. <laughs> Welcome to Dartmouth, John. <laughs> Just a quick note on process. After our conversation, we'll open up questions both here in the room and also online. If you are online, please use the Q&A button to uh, deliver those questions. And Tori, I pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, and thank you to both our guests who will teach us a bit about what history can say about our current moment, but also help us look forward to what we may be facing down the road. And I also want to thank them both for, rather than going for a traditional lecture where they each would give up and give remarks, they both said, let's have a conversation. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, we are all ready for this COVID pandemic to be in our rear view mirror. And in a moment, I will take you to where we are today and how we look forward. But you're also both historians, and you both have taken a deep look at how innovation, governance, individual spirit, and medicine and science have influenced in the past how we've dealt with pandemics. So John, I, I'm gonna start with you. Um, obviously, your book became a bestseller. It may not have become a bestseller in 2005, or maybe it was, but I think it also became a bestseller in the last few years as we face COVID, called The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. And in it, uh, you note that 100 million people died at the time. So maybe a very simple 
two questions. Do you look back and see key moments where a decision made a difference into the path of that pandemic at the time? Uh, and then second, there's a description in your book both about these individuals who led in a response, but you also make observations about the role of institutions and governance in working to respond when those signs are there. So the tension between individuals and institutions. So let me, let me start with those two questions for you. Okay. Well, first, the, the context was so different because we were at war. There was more effort to control thought in that war than any other time in American history. They passed a law that made it punishable by 20 years in jail, basically to criticize the government. They enforced it. A congressman was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, and, you know, that was the context, the infrastructure into which this pandemic fell. Uh, you know, so, so that, if there was anything key in terms of the response, that was the key. As a, they, were, they considered telling the truth, or the government did, both in local governments generally echoed uh, the national government and newspapers, editors cooperated. Uh, they felt that telling the truth would hurt morale, which would hurt the war effort. Uh, and that was, I think, critical in uh, the numbers of deaths and the slowness in the public health response. You know, back then, of course, they had essentially no therapeutics. They had developed vaccines against some diseases. Uh, all they had were public health measures. And they had turned around, saved, you know, you know, millions of lives with sanitation uh, and, and, and things like that. And they understood what we now call non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, but they, by and large, employed them way too late. Uh, and I think a lot of that was a political decision. You know, in the book, I talk about a particular uh, parade in Philadelphia to raise money for the war, which a lot of the medical community said, cancel it, cancel it. They didn't cancel it. Uh, in terms of the institutions, almost the same statement, with rare exceptions. San Francisco was an exception, but almost every other place, local governments took the same approach as, as the national government. And you know, as a result, people died. Uh, you know, people did catch on fairly quickly. Uh, everybody knows McLuhan's line, the medium is the message. There, the medium was everyday life. And that pandemic moved much more rapidly and was much more lethal than what we're going through. Plus, it killed, number one, children under the age of 10. And number two, otherwise, hell, there was another peak at age 28. Well, over 95% of the excess mortality was people younger than 65 years old. Uh, so when you see your next door neighbor die, 24 hours after the first symptom, you don't care what the government is telling you that this is nothing to worry about. You, you're, you're afraid. Uh, and, you know, I think society is based on trust. As trust disappears, society begins to fray and can do a lot more than fray. Uh, I think all of that occurred in many communities in the United States, not every community. Uh, and again, it was decisions made by people. In, in that discussion in your book, you also reflect a bit on American culture. And I want to read just two quotes and see if they go together. One is, knowledge is useless and less accessible. And the other is, nowhere did individuals feel freer to question authority than in America. And nowhere was, that, where, was the chaos greater. And so in your discussion about truth and not truth, you know, is that a cultural situation that America had and no longer has? Is that something you find a bit enduring as I move you away from that pandemic to the current one? Well, I mean, I didn't know. I, those are good quotes. I didn't know. I said. <laughs> <laughs> Page 29. I'll have to, I'll have to remember them. Uh, 
Some things I say I actually do remember and reuse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've never actually done an in-depth comparison of our culture with others. So there's a certain level of assumption in that. But from my you know, fairly brief look at the cultures that I know something about, all of which are Western European, um, yeah, I would say that that was true then and is probably still true. Uh, as we have all, been, you know, people in my own family, someone fairly close to me is QAnon. It's, I can't understand it. She's not a complete idiot. You know, uh, she thinks she's doing her own research and coming to her own conclusions, you know, which I'm sure every faculty member urges everybody in the class to do that. But somehow you got to rate your sources as reliable and try to correlate reality with, uh, I mean, which was the first revolution in, in medicine when the French in the early 19th century started correlating results with treatments and figured out that bleeding really didn't work. How did the pandemic finally come to an end? Uh, the virus changed, and people's immune systems caught up through a combination. Uh, the 1918 virus had the ability to uh, bind with cells in the upper respiratory tract, which of course makes it transmissible, as well as bind to cells deep in the lung, which made it potentially lethal. Uh, it essentially lost the ability to bind to cells deep in the lung uh, over time. You know, even seasonal influenza, you know, that does happen, but it's very unusual uh, that a seasonal influenza virus will cause viral pneumonia. Uh, there were basically four, they're generally regarded as three waves in 1918 including in my book, I referred to three waves. But there was actually a fourth wave. And even though I didn't call it a fourth wave, at least I reported the data from, from that. Uh, I didn't call it a fourth wave because contemporaries didn't. Just as we are today, they thought they were tired of it. It was in the rearview mirror. They didn't want to deal with it anymore. So the fourth wave, even though it was pretty nasty, was largely ignored. But that was in the fall of 1920. By 1921, however, Deaths were back to pre-pandemic levels, and it had already be mutated its way to seasonal influenza. Again, some of that, a lot of it, was that your immune, people's immune systems caught up, uh, but the virus also changed. Um, and if you had never been exposed to an influenza virus, or this is true of pretty much every pathogen, uh, your so-called virgin population, you know. That, is, that disease was extremely lethal. Uh, you know, places are around the world with 20, 30 percent, not case mortality, mortality, the entire population uh, dying. And, you know, so again, the immune system is a, is a, fa is a significant factor. Uh, but I can yeah. yield to, to, to I'm sure it's time for you to say something. <laughs> well, Kendall, you wrote a book in 2012 yourself, and it's called Long Shot, Vaccines for National Defense. And you probe the history then of vaccine development, looking at factors that foster both timely innovation, but also I think you discovered the vaccine, vaccine innovation had fallen since World War II. And I'll note, I'll come back to you both, because you both look at the impact of war and disease and their interactions, both for innovation and for spread. But tell us in your book, is that true that innovation has been falling since World War II? Um, how, would it, you, how would you talk to us about that? Well, I mean, a lot of things drove that. We didn't think it had fallen, actually. I mean, if you look at the data, it makes it look like innovation rates are going up. But um, when you start to look at, you know, as look tracking vaccine licenses issued, well, what did they represent? They started to represent things like name changes or like very, very incremental, non-innovative things. And so, you know, I started to categorize it. I was like, wait a minute. 
innovation's not going up at all. And so what is it about the R&D ecosystem that allowed us to have such high rates, not just during World War II, but really mid-century? And then well, why, why would it, what's changing? Why is it going down now? And it has a lot to do with um, a large number of factors, but you know, the, uh, if you look at, it, it might be easier to talk about what made it better because actually it came back to where it was before. Um, what made it better was you the mean fact, made it, what made it why did we have this spurt of innovation um, during World War II and in the immediate years after. And, you know, part of it had to do with our experience with the 1918 flu, you know, at the end of World War I. And war planners saw, you know, well, they thought another world war might generate the epidemiological conditions for another pandemic. And so they treated it as a national security issue and they invested in it accordingly. So we had these vaccine development commissions that were crash programs to develop vaccines. Um, and so it was a completely new way of doing research and development. You had teams, you had commanders, you know, you had top-down directors with integrated command structures. Um, you had this shared sense of urgency. So there was, you know, people working across party lines, people working with industry and academia and government and military. These, these were groups that hadn't worked together before. And it worked well when the underlying science was well understood, as it was with flu at that point. Then you could consolidate and apply what you knew. When the underlying science wasn't well understood, it fell apart, so it failed. So it only works under certain circumstances. But I think we forget, like we look at Operation Warp Speed and we had a vaccine in a year and that was amazing. We, we did this in the 40s. We had a working, the first working flu vaccine within 19 months of initiating the program. We had the very first Japanese encephalitis vaccine within 15 months of initiating that program. Um, we had, we'd never developed botulinum toxoid. We, there was, turned out to be faulty intelligence, but intelligence that the Germans were loading V1 bombs with the toxin. And so we made this and we shipped it over and we had it ready for D-Day. You know, we didn't end up needing it, but it, in terms of a crash development program, it was really impressive. Um, and so it became sort of the beginning of this, you know, these integrated command, you know, um, team-based uh, product development approach to uh, vaccine development, and that carried over. We did it, we saw it at Walter Reed, we saw it at Merck, um, and then you know, a variety of factors started to erode those relationships. One of the things was we started to be able to patent things, and so we weren't sharing information in quite the same way that we were before. Um, you know, the base of funding shifted from the military to the NIH, which had a different incentive structure. It was about individual-based, you know, investigator-initiated research again. It wasn't about sharing everything with your team with this highly interdisciplinary approach where nobody's trying to gain credit. Um, it was, you know, a sense of public duty shifted. The um, companies, a lot of companies during World War II and after made vaccines, um, at low to no profit because it was, quote, the right thing to do. They felt they had a duty to do it for the military or for public health or what have you. And pharmaceutical R&D got more and more profitable. And then they were you know, no longer private companies but publicly held companies with stockholders who expected quarterly returns. You know, the whole dynamic changed completely. Mm -hmm. um, so. So as historians, if I had asked you five years, do you expect to have a pandemic of the COVID style in your lifetime? Because most of your examples were earlier than when you were experiencing it. What would you have said? Did you expect that we'd have a pandemic like we do today? John? Uh, <laughs> well, I knew it was inevitable. I think what everybody... Was yeah. Every, you know, everybody expected it to be influenza. You've got H5N1, you've got H7N9, you know, you've got some other uh, influenza viruses that are circulating that are, that are threats. Um, but there is, you know, 
I don't think there's anybody in the public health community who dealt with pandemics who didn't expect one. The only question was when. Uh, you know, it's a stochastic event, so we could have a new virus enter the population, it may have already happened, and it's about to start spreading, or it may be, you know, another 100 years. That would be nice if it were. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, did I expect it in my lifetime? You know, I'm getting old, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to avoid it. I can remember in 2009, I actually got an email from a virologist in San Diego before there was any public information. That was where the H1N1 was first found, and telling me that you know there was an, that this was here. And I remember how I felt at the time. You know, you literally gut wrenching and so forth. Obviously, that that turned out to be okay. Uh, I should have given you a short answer, yes. Well, no, it's, it, it's interesting because you both have been historians of this, and yet sometimes the imagination is, is hard to bring it to the present. But I appreciate the way you explained that. Kendall, how about you? Well, my husband loves to say I've predicted 10 out of the last two pandemics. <laughs> so it's fair to say that I've been in a state of heightened expectation. <laughs> um, but I, when you look at, you know, Climate change and human development patterns are very potent upstream drivers of viral spillover events, which is what this was, um, and transmission. You know, so you have you know, more mobility in denser populations, which just creates the substrate. It's like you know, taking a snow globe and shaking it. You get all this viral yeah. recombination and giving it all kinds of opportunities to move around. So, you know, I, I think, you know, this is inevitable and probably going to be more frequent given when you look at the drivers. Yeah, yeah I mean, there were probably many spillover events mm -hmm. in the past that died out because mm -hmm. of the lack the of mobility. The SARS-1, that was scary. Well, it was scary. I mean, that was obviously much easier to control. What year was that? 2003. 2002, yeah, three, two, three, four. Yeah, uh, because you weren't train really contagious until you were already really sick. So same with Ebola. So, you know, and same with MERS. Uh, so you can contain it for that reason. Even, even with that, it, it almost exploded. It would never have become what COVID is. Right. Because when you're most contagious, you're flat on your back. It's the uh, asymptomatic transmission. That's the, that I mean, there is, a, you know, like 30% of influenza is asymptomatic transmission. Uh, COVID's like 60%, but, uh, you know, that, that's really the, the driver, you know. So how worried should most people be? You, you cited earlier we have Operation Warp Speed, and that seemed to do the trick pretty fast. We got vaccinations. 11 billion vaccination doses have been administered around the world while uneven. That's a pretty unbelievable um, enterprise. So how do you balance that ability to respond quickly in the moment with your point about we used to be better at innovation as you look to the future? Like what are the elements in place to do that again and again and so we can sort of relax or was that a, a lucky shot? Yeah, no, I think that's, you're asking the right question. Um, and that's sort of the point of the commission, right? Let's learn the right lessons. And that can be really hard to do because Operation Warp Speed was phenomenal. You know, it was a, you know, we weren't, that was an incredible timeline. And, you know, people closest to it still are picking their jaws up off the floor. You know, it's 10,000 things had to go right, and they did. Um, and so, there's a victory narrative there, and it's a little bit fraught. You know, everyone wants to claim credit, but it's not, you know, very entirely a story about industry that came to the rescue or government that came to the rescue. And one way to look at that and think about it is, you know, Pfizer was first across the finish line with their mRNA. They accepted very little government support up to that point. But then Moderna, which accepted a great deal of government support, was just one week behind. So it's 
not clear. But then if you look at warp speed itself, um, the, there, were, if you, there were six candidates, two thirds of which, you know, there were and with three platforms, two of those three platforms had never been licensed by the FDA before. So that was a little bit of a roll of the dice. Um, so it's Novavax, the other. Sorry? Novavax, is that the? Second? Yeah, so there's the mRNA, right. which is Pfizer and Moderna, and then there was the um, viral vector vaccines. Those hadn't been okay. licensed before. Okay. Um, so they that was the AstraZeneca and, and J&J. &J. Okay. Um, so there's like the replicating viral vector and the non-replicating viral vector. So we hadn't done non-replicating okay. before. Um, and then the protein subunit vaccines. Those we had done before, but those took longer. Um, point being, they all worked. Um, that was kind of incredible too. If you look at you know, um, Chris Snyder, who's an economist here, did some really interesting work on probability of success and what should, how many candidates should you have in your portfolio to really maximize your probability of success. The number is closer to 27, right? So, what if, you have to think about the counterfactuals, what if they failed? 90% of vaccines fail in development from the very beginning. Now these were more technologically mature, you know, so you had a higher rate of success, but we did get lucky. And so then imagine a world in which we had to get in line behind other countries to buy a vaccine from China or from Russia. What would we wish we had done differently? Um, and I th that's an important exercise. Would we have wished we'd maybe contributed more generously and upfront to multilateral procurement mechanisms like COVAX, just as even an insurance policy? I mean, there are, there are measures you might wanna take the next time around. Yeah. So you both touched on a range of measures, including public health measures, uh, setting up vaccinations or supply chains and understanding those challenges also distribution of existing vaccinations and all. So tell us a bit about the next, this commission that you're on and what the focus is on trying to get ready for the next potential pandemic. Um, where would you put your emphasis and what do you think that the, particularly the US government should be thinking about right now? Do you wanna go first? Okay, well first I wanna reiterate what, Ken, what Kendall said, we were lucky, you know, the best influenza vaccine ever produced is 61% effective. Most of them are considerably less than that, I guess. I think it was three years ago, it was only 10% effective, 0% effective in the elderly. So we were dealing with a virus this time around that's actually turns out to be pretty easy to hit the target on. Obviously, HIV, been looking for a vaccine for 15 years more than closer, I guess, more than 20 now. Uh, very, very diligent efforts and we're nowhere. I don't, not nowhere, but you know. So we were lucky. Uh, as far as the commission goes, you know, I, I, honestly I'm not optimistic that it's gonna come into existence. Uh, it would be independent. Uh, it would be funded by foundations as, as uh, you heard in the introduction. Uh, there was a lot of momentum toward it, but it wouldn't have subpoena power. So for it to go forward, it would have to have, or it wants to, you know, Phil Zellico, the director, would like to have, and the funders, the foundations, would like the White House to not so much, co well, to cooperate. We, want, we would want to be completely independent, but without subpoena power, the White House would have to agree to deliver documents and, and produce people uh, to testify. Uh, you know, I think it might be successful without that, but so far the White House hasn't done that. I think that's very unfortunate. I know, uh, I, you know Fauci, among others, has uh, endorsed the idea of, uh, the commission that both of us might be involved with if it ever comes to be. Uh, but the momentum is clearly stalled. 
and I, I think it's necessary. Uh, I think there's been some effort in Congress to uh, move some legislation, but I think anything that has people appointed by members of both parties in the Congress, as the legislation proposes, is going to you know, descend very quickly into ridiculous arguments. You know, no doubt the Republicans would appoint some of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration and so forth. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. Not that I, I think those views need to be represented. It is a very legitimate position, as I'm sure everybody in this room would agree, to weigh the economy versus uh, public health. Nobody would have proposed closing down the economy for the 2009 pandemic. They'd have been crazy to do that uh, and would have gotten zero support from anyone for doing it. Uh, it had this. So that position has to be way, you know, the economic impact has to be considered. Uh, but anyway, I've said enough. So. But if I have a magic wand and say, we will create your commission, what would you like it to do? We have an audience here where maybe you could help convince this room, at least, of the importance of not just looking at the past, but being prepared for the future. Okay, well, they, they already have done a lot of work. And the question has been divided into four areas, one of which was origin, the second of which would, would be the federal response, the third of which would be state of local response, and the fourth of which was how to prepare for the next one in terms of building manufacturing capacity, research capacity. Kendall's extremely involved in, in that fourth one. Um, primarily would be involved probably in the second one. Uh, it's very well thought out, and you know, there has been a lot of work done so far. And I hope it does come to pass. So, Ken, I'm going to ask you one more question, yeah. and then I think we'll turn to the audience. So what would be the things, if the president called you up, that you would recommend mm -hmm. that the U.S. do? Uh, I'm just waiting for that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the first thing I would point to is that you know, there's a lot of high-level consensus on what the right thing is to do already. We, we've had very good pandemic preparedness plans, starting with the Bush administration to now. What it is is a failure to execute. And so, you know, you've got, this is, a, everyone owns a piece of this problem, but nobody is accountable for solving it at a higher level. So there's a leadership and a coordination problem in government that we need to address first. Um, and, you know, we, if you just look at Operation Warp Speed, I mean, we temporarily fixed it with that, with Slowey. I mean, he had um, budgetary control. He had cross-agency control. He had political cover. When he wanted to do something, he didn't need to go to the White House five times to ask for permission. He just did it. And he was able to bring the full weight of the US government to bear on this problem. I mean, he used um, you know, faster transaction authorities to make contracts really quickly. He was able to use the Defense Production Act to resolve bottlenecks and expand capacity for front runners. He was able to use the military to help with supply chain logistics. And you know, he was able to streamline. He was able to convince the industry to use the same endpoint for the clinical trials. I mean, so you were comparing apples to apples. I mean, it was an extraordinary effort, and it worked. But, but then he, was, he left after a year. So that system's still in place. No. So it's, <laughs> it was a one time, it was short term COVID specific, and it's over. And so now you no longer have this integrated command structure which is essential to see the kind of outcome that we saw in the time frame that we saw it. So now we have um, coordination by committee. And we all know how that goes. <laughs> so, and we've got variants of concern. And what's the plan? Well, industry's telling us what to do. Government isn't telling industry what to do. And it's, it's not as constructive as it really could be or should be. So that's point one, leadership and coordination. Point two, we need. Um, a way, strategic pandemic portfolio, which is a way to think rationally about 
how and where we're going to spend money for preparedness going forward. Um, and that means you know, doing risk assessments and tying it to, you know, a lot of this you have to do through industry, right? Government isn't, you're partnering with industry to get the various tools that you need to, you know. And so, you know, we need a much more sophisticated investment strategy where you're uh, pairing the right asset with the right kind of capital. So you're attracting the best possible partners with the right incentive structures and getting the right outcomes. So it's part about learning how to do business um, on the government side. And so, you know, it comes right down to, you know, improving contracting and making that more sophisticated too. So, you know, when HHS gets across the negotiating table with Pfizer, they're outgunned every time. But that's negotiation and that's contracting and that's teachable and there are best practices and there are ways we can do this better for the, in the public interest. And you know, given that everything's gonna be done through contract, we have to figure out how to improve public interest innovation this way. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that it's not just widgets, you know, it's not just getting these cool new technologies, it's about having operational capabilities um, and one of the things that is still not represented in, in any of the legislation coming through is this idea of building an on-demand capacity. So when, you know, you, it's, you can't know what the next virus will be, but can you develop a new vaccine or therapeutic in 100 days? So what does it take to create that capacity? And it's, it's something that you, you need an integrated command structure for it. You need um, to exercise it repeatedly. It's, you know, we, we were talking about this. You know, if you're in the Air Force, you don't just buy a jet you know, and, and stick it in the hangar. You, you, you train pilots and you exercise uh, routines regularly at great expense. And so we need to turn the crank on this 100-day capability all the time not just when there's an outbreak. So. I think you're ready for the president to call, Kendall. Okay, okay so. good. <laughs> there, there, there. Let me... Uh, well, let me add... Oh, go ahead. One All right. area but that also just... needs uh, a lot of work is surveillance, surveillance. Inter internationally. You know, the um, international health regulations, uh, which our international <laughs> law require every... Well, there are uh, 194 or 196 signatories, I can't remember. Uh, which, but they actually require countries to have a certain capability for surveillance. Now, the vast majority uh, and response, too, and then notification and so forth are all part of the regulations. Um, but the capacity for surveillance does not exist, uh, nor in many countries does the capacity to respond. And that's all part of protecting our security and you know, the health of the world. Fantastic. All right. Let me look out. I think we've got uh, a microphone right here. Uh, I know we've got some students who are first up. And then I'll go to Don for the online questions. The gentleman right here. Hi. Um, thank you both so much for being here today. Um, I believe one of you touched a little bit previously on like the intersection of like pandemics and then um, like climate change. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how like climate has affected um, like pandemics in the past and also like given the trajectory of climate change, how um, like climate change could affect um, pandemic and pandemic responses in the future. Okay, well, we, well you talk. I, I then, can so. give you like yeah. sort of like how it affects it and then you can give some maybe historical examples. Probably not, but <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about it. You have some in your book. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, so the big thing that happens is, you know, when, yeah. It, 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 animals and humans ha lose their ecological niche, and so they go somewhere else. So it could be that we're encroaching on, you know, Brazilian rainforests, or, you know, the mosquitoes are coming further north because it's, and other animals are coming further north because it's just the equator is uninhabitable, and so you're getting um, human and animal populations that are interacting in ways that they hadn't done before. And so you get these spillover events. And I think 70% of, 
um, you know, infectious, human infectious disease is zoonotic in origin, comes from animals. So it's a significant driver. Yeah. So you have two things. You have development, which, and then climate change. The most obvious difference would be uh, vectors, you know, insect vectors, uh, which, you know, have a much wider range, uh, much further north. Uh, for for some of them, you know, that's probably the most obvious example. Uh, in terms of development, a good example would be the Nipah virus, where the, another bat virus that uh, you know jumped to people because in fact the bats apparently flew like 100 miles uh, because they're natural. Uh, uh, for, Areas that they were located in, we wiped out, and they ended up on. I think it was banana plantation, not banana, some other fruit, and you know, th their droppings infected people, and you know that is a nasty virus. Uh, so fortunately, it's not really a respiratory virus, I don't think, but you know, the, the risks are, are very real, and they do grow. They are growing, so. All right, great question. Thank you. We have Sarah here. Hi. 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 Well, the microphone's coming. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the efficacy of border control policies in um, in pandemic response. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear border the question. Control border policies. control policies. So, well, to what extent are they? And, and in your book, um, you spoke about the oh impact God. of the. Um, military coming and going during the war and troops and soldiers coming back and yeah. having been, um, and so you didn't speak specifically about whether or not they were bringing the virus back, but it was somewhat implied. And so I guess the question now is in today's world, do we feel that's it's a way to stem the, you know, the, the flow? The, you know, I think that the war accelerated the spread of the 1918 virus. But other than that, it didn't play a role. And by accelerating the spread, you're talking about a period of a few weeks. You know, in 1698, an influenza pand uh, pandemic managed to cross from the, the Atlantic and had a, you know, perhaps second only to smallpox effect on Native Americans. Uh, you know, so you don't need airplanes or even steamships uh, to spread a pandemic. Uh, you know, border closings, I mean, there was modeling done that uh, for influenza, which is less infectious, less transmissible than COVID, the, uh, at CDC that said if you were 90% effective in sealing the border, then it would delay the spread by less than a week. If you were 99%, it would delay the spread by three weeks. Um, you can't close borders. You know, there are, you know, plus if you look, if you have one index case and it's highly transmissible, it doesn't really matter if you start with one or if you start with 100 because it's going to catch up to 100 index cases very rapidly. I think politically, it's something that people have to consider doing, but the best you're going to get is a few weeks difference. Uh, I can remember sitting in meetings, and you know, I was involved in the Bush administration and the planning process. I can remember sitting in meetings where an assistant secretary of HHS said the French are going to demand borders be closed, and indeed. When two, you know, a couple of years later, when H1N1 surfaced, the French wanted the EU to cancel all flights to Mexico. It would be basically meaningless. And those temperature checks are, are worthless. Uh, I mean, they're really ridiculous show. Uh, but again, politically, if somebody wants to demonstrate that they're taking something seriously and that they're doing something, it's going to be difficult to resist, and I'm not sure if I were 
advising somebody, I would even advise them to resist it because the criticism they get for not doing it is probably not, not the price would probably be too high. But very minimal impact on the course of a pandemic. Unless you really were in a position where a couple of weeks is really going to make a difference. If that's the case, then you know, it would be worth doing. That's highly unlikely. I would just say it's important, I think, to, um, you know, you think about the political cost of not doing it. You also have to think about maybe the economic or, or even the strategic costs, because when you, let's say you want to make a vaccine or, you know, a particular antiviral, we have 47 foreign dependencies. You know, it is, we are so globalized and so specialized can you, at this Can you point. explain what you mean by that? What I mean is you cannot make that medicine unless you have a trade and travel. You know, you need to be able to, uh, tri ships need to come in and flights need to come in. And globalization is part of the solution as much as it's part of the problem. And the other thing is you want, we talk about surveillance and you want countries to cooperate and if you're going to punish them every time they cooperate, you're not going to get the cooperation. You know, South Africa is very upset over, you know, they uncovered Omicron and let the world know when they got punished for it significantly. And now they've got Omicron BA4 and 5 circulating. Right now, we're concerned about where, where, where that's going. And before we go further, I do want to... Uh, plug one Dartmouth graduate who's intimately involved in pandemic preparedness, Marty Setrone, who's at CDC. Uh, yeah, he's on the board. I think he's online, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think he's a former member of uh, the board. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah, well I played. I didn't know that. <laughs> he did email me and say, said that he'd be watching. So, but, uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I don't know if any of you read Michael Lewis's book, Premonition, but uh, Marty deserved a lot better <laughs> than, you know, I, actually I know Michael Lewis, he's from New Orleans and so forth, and he's a casual friend, and, you know, and the others, people, Richard Hatchett and Carter Master, I, you know, very friendly with Richard and, and, and Carter, and they did great work, but Mar Marty really deserved a lot of credit, which he did not get in that book. Well, that might be right. Turn, Dawn, do you have any questions from the audience? I do. Name Marty. <laughs> I, I do. No, not, no, but it's an interesting segue. Uh, we have a question from an online person saying, Michael Lewis in The Premonition <laughs> said that the CDC is good at figuring out precisely what had happened, but by the time they'd done it, the fighting was over. Question is, does the CDC need to be repurposed and reorganized, and could it be? You probably have more insight into that. You know, uh, I mean, the CDC in 2009 responded very aggressively, very quickly. This time around, they, you know, they didn't. Uh, you know, I don't know whether that's, a, yeah, I'm pretty friendly with two local public health leaders, Amy Acton, who is in Ohio, and Ohio initially was by far the earliest, most aggressive response, but she left that office. And the other is Jennifer Vegno in New Orleans. And both of them say the same thing that Charity Dean said in that book. They, they did not find CDC at all helpful. So, you know, that's bad news, but I, you know, talk about telling the truth, and that's what both of them said. Uh, and along with Charity Dean in that, in that book. Um, you know, whether it needs reorganization, something needs to be done. You know, I, I'm not sure what. I'm not an expert on CDC. But in, again, in 2009, I think everything worked. I mean, obviously, the stress wasn't there. But when that started, nobody knew what the stress would be. Plus, in 1918, the first wave was really mild and the virus and not particularly transmissible. Then the virus became very transmissible and very lethal. So you don't know whether it's going to turn. Uh, you know, but that just didn't, they just, they seemed to think it was 
SARS. And maybe Marty will comment uh, online on this, because obviously he was right in the middle of it. Uh, SARS-1 was obviously containable. But until the middle of February, you know, I mean, everything that they were supposed to do, they did in terms of functional triggers, like immediately upon the ProMed notice, you know, they convene, you know, they're in their war room and in their secure skiff and all this stuff, and making all the preparations. But they still were, they just, you know, there are a lot of people who thought in the middle of January this was going to be very, very bad, uh, and, and including myself. I wrote an op-ed in January. Uh, but they didn't react. All right. Uh, we'll pass on that yeah. one, Kendall. OK. Uh, I think we have a question over here. I want to come back to the question of politics. And John, before you wrote about flus and floods, you wrote about Congress in a book called The Ambition and the Power. Ah, about the one <laughs> of the few who's ever. <laughs> <laughs> about the, the fall of uh, Speaker of the House Jim Wright. And uh, it was a time where it was still possible to get things done across the aisle, although not quite in the way that Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan did, as you said in that book. But if you imagine us turning back the clock uh, before QAnon, as you mentioned, before social media, disinformation, MAGA, parlor, um, might we have had, in your opinion, more vaccine sort of cooperation, for lack of a better word, and, and less vaccine hesitancy in, in a less perilous political oh, time. Oh, easily. I mean, sure. Somehow, first masks, and then that was crazy enough, but it's even crazier. A vaccine somehow got tied up in ideology. Uh, it's, and because and Trump, yeah. I mean, if Trump, from the beginning, and and Republican leadership elsewhere from the very beginning, he talked about how good vaccines were. Yeah, I, I think we wouldn't, wouldn't have. It's already a pretty small minority. It's, they're very vocal, but they're small. I mean, remember, I think it's 88% of Americans have gotten at least one shot of eligible Americans. I might be slightly wrong on that number, but not by much. And 75% of adults are fully vaccinated. That's a lot. So you could have squeezed that number way, way down if you, you know, in Louisiana is one of the, it's kind of mixed. In New Orleans, your very high uh, vaccination rates. But there are other areas of Louisiana. Louisiana is the only state where a higher percentage of African Americans vaccinated than whites. If you go into some of the rural areas of Louisiana, you're at 50 percent or less. In some rare cases, less than 50 percent, and that's all political, and it's all all because, you know, it's all fake news and it's not really real and so forth and so on. And people going to uh, the hospital as they're being intubated, saying, "I don't have COVID." But I think you had mentioned that it was a local community leader that had really right. generated that. And well, I think that gets to the root of yeah. how you combat a lot of misinformation. You have to go. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's very tailored. It's each community. Um, and it's yeah. you know some of the social media platforms only go so far. But if you know, your local community leader is saying, this is important, well, then that's, that's really where the human mind goes. There was actually a fantastic, um, at a CEPI meeting, they had um, a scientific meeting. This is post Ebola, and a um, bunch of like, you know, middle-aged scientists in the room, but this beautiful woman in West African headdress came down to the podium and started to sing. It was the beginning of the meeting, and she was a Liberian pop star. And what she had done in the beginning of Ebola, she wrote a pop song about the virus and what it was and how it was transmitted and how you protect yourself. And the song went viral, and it worked. <laughs> like that was sort of like the message. That was the you know she knew the community, she knew how to reach them, and it's not always what you think. 
Um, and I do think that like, somewhere in there lies the answer to how we start to tackle some yeah. of these issues. I mean, I mean, suppose you had Trump, Obama, Clinton, and Bush making joint statements yeah. on the vaccine. You know, personalities got in the way. There, in terms of local, at the beginning of the pandemic, James Carville actually organized an effort that I was part of. His idea was to attack things the same way you do a political campaign, census tract by census tract. Whoever the local influencer is, whether it's a high school football coach or somebody else, that was, a, and we had Palantir involved identifying the uh, hot counties and so forth and so on. It was, it was actually a pretty well organized effort. Uh, you know, we had, you know, Kyle Rose, chief of staff. Uh, wait, 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 it wasn't by any, you know, it's not, you know, I had governors from both parties and or former governors. Uh, but we never, we were successful actually in getting celebrities who are not that effective. Uh, but we were not very successful in, in uh, getting the local people that we were originally targeted for. You know, I actually had some ends with the swamp people in Louisiana. I'm sure you've all watched that reality show. This, you know, they're alligator hunters, the swamp people. You've all watched it, right? Yeah, but I mean, they didn't want, want to cooperate. Uh, we did do things like have uh, Matthew McConaughey interview Fauci, uh, uh, you know, and that was broadcast. And Tiffany Haddish, we had her interview Fauci. But again, the, the, and, and they probably did resonate in certain communities, but we never succeeded in getting uh, the local people that we were really targeting. Okay. Don, do you have one more? Well, let's go over here first. Tony, hang on, the microphone's coming your way. Um, my question's about um, the Chinese approach. Um, you know, I'm assuming that the Chinese, closer. the Chinese are pretty smart. There's a rationale for their approach. I've heard some, but I want to know whether you think there is a rationale for their approach, and um, and probably more importantly, how you think it's going to play out if they continue that approach. Are you referring to zero COVID? Yeah, zero, zero tolerance. I think it's doomed. Yeah, for the same reason that you described with the borders. Yeah. So how does it play out? And particularly, remember, 40% of the population is rural. That's 600 million people. You can't lock down a rural area. What are they going to do when it gets in the rural communities? You know, I just don't see it happening. You know, it's, it's barely conceivable, I think highly unlikely, but conceivable they can do whack-a-mole you know, one city at a time which is still going to be enormously disruptive to their economy and to the world's supply chains. But I don't see how even that can succeed. You know, what the geopolitical ramifications are for their leadership, you know, I, I don't know enough about China to pontificate. And I usually don't hesitate to pontificate on anything. <laughs> <laughs> Kendall, I thought how it's going to play out. There are going to be a lot of sick people. You know, their vaccine is, you know, it's not entirely worthless. They failed to uh, produce an mRNA vaccine. Uh, the Russian vaccine isn't bad. You, but they, I mean, you would sort of think Putin would be sending the Russian vaccine there and that they would want it, but they don't seem to be doing even that, so. Kendall, in your 49 component parts, or whatever you were describing related to creating vaccinations, China is part of that? Oh, absolutely. We, is, is, the yeah. uh, is the American supply chain for future vaccinations requiring some parts or some cooperation with China? Absolutely. Um, and moreover, I mean, so China's behind the eight ball on mRNA now, but they're going to leap ahead because they're, they have a, yeah. a very well thought out industrial strategy. They're not afraid to have industrial policy and state planning. And so their mRNA infrastructure is going to explode. 
and it's going to be targeted at infectious disease applications. Meanwhile, Pfizer and Moderna are going to move away from infectious disease applications in the U.S. And why is that? Because it's not as profitable as right. other things that you can be doing. Right. Um, and so without you know, a really specific industrial policy of our own where we're making you know, slightly uncomfortable judgments that you know, don't preference free markets and profits, you know, we're going to, you know, there are strategic reasons um, that we might want to onshore some things and invest, maintain, you know, mRNA infrastructure for infectious disease applications. So they, you know, they'll leap ahead in that respect. Um, All right. I see Don and then Terry Ann. This is actually two part. It's the same question, but slightly different for both of you. John, with the benefit of hindsight, did the 1918 pandemic create net increase? or decrease in institutional trust? And what specific thing did the government do or not do that was a driver of this gain or loss of trust? And then Kendall, although we are still in the current pandemic, would you predict this pandemic will create net gain or loss of confidence? And what will be the principal driver of this trust or loss of institutional trust? I'm assuming this is in the United States. OK, well, it had to decrease trust. It had to. I mean, people were flat lied to. Every, and I mean, in Philadelphia, for example, when they finally closed, one of my favorite quotes from a newspaper, they finally belatedly closed all the schools, churches, bars, you know, pub band public gatherings. One of the newspapers actually said, this is not a public health measure. You have no cause for panic or alarm. <laughs> I mean, how stupid did they think their readers were? You know, so how can you trust anything you read in that newspaper? And, you know, this is when people are dying around you. In Philadelphia, I mean, they're literally priests driving horse-drawn carts through the streets calling by people to bring out their dead. Mass graves. And this is no cause. This is not a public health measure. Uh, you know, that's an extreme example. You know, in terms of, it's, it's not a question I looked at, and even if I had, I can't imagine how I might have been able to measure it. So I can't talk about what the impact was or how long it took for our trust to rebuild. Um, but it had to, it had to hurt. Yeah. So uh, the Pew um, research, they they have. They measure trust in government right. somehow over time. I don't think no, back then, but back then, no. certainly if you look at it over the course of the 20th century, it was really high post-war right. because we won the war. And you know the economy was booming. And it really took a hit in the 70s you know, with stagflation and any number of uh, issues we were having as a country. And it's gone down since. Um, and this is. Trusting government is highly correlated with, you know, our willingness to cooperate with, you know, public health messages, believe them, and or accept vaccination, um, and, you know, you can correlate those things too. So it really matters, and I think it's one reason why the commission really matters because the objective is to look at the CDC and to look at the NIH and to look at how do we make government work better. And have, I mean, that is, how do you instill trust in government with competence? And certainly we demonstrated competence with Operation Warp Speed. Government can do amazing things. You just have to figure out how to structure things so that it can function as intended. Um, so, yeah. Can I jump in? Because yeah. Marty Cetron just responded to this. So <laughs> Although we have hot off the presses, right? Uh, just one short comment. Pandemic responses are whole of society efforts, political, private, public sector, populations, public health. They need to pull in some degree of unity with a shared goal and glued together by the lubricant of trust. Each component is necessary, but not sufficient. This pandemic, unlike smallpox, occurred in a very different context. Sadly, we are living in an era of a bankruptcy of trust. Thank you very much. Why don't we go over here? I have one more question, but then I think we'll look to wrap this up. All right. Oh, we have another one here. No. Oh, oh I thought you wanted to say something. 
Um, so I think that's probably relates a little bit to that trust question, and it's hard to follow that comment, I think, because um, there's so much truth in it. I'm just wondering what both of your opinion is about um, whether some of the failure in the United States, in addition to what you've talked about, is our fragmented healthcare system, and whether if the government actually was providing health care to all of us, whether that's through contracting with private entities or not, there'd be more trust. And if we had a universal vaccine program for everything for our population, given outbreaks of other diseases that are vaccine preventable, would that make a difference? Okay, great. Well, I mean, you can look at, I mean, the UK, I guess. Right. They have the NHS. Um, you know, I, I'd be curious to know what their sense of trust is, but their outcomes were no better. I mean, the, the virus, you know, I think their, the rate of infection in the, U, the EU is like 80%. The UK is even higher, I think. Um, so, you know, but I do think, you know, just in, that's just in terms of outcome. You're really asking a question about trust, which is different. And um, I do think those factors would matter, you know, when you have you know, the same health care. There's not this tremendous sense of disparity, um, which I think drives a lot of distrust. Well, I was thinking in particular the Indian Health Service. Mm -hmm. They did an exceptional job. If the Indian Health Service, if, if I understand it correctly, did an exceptional job in creating um, and getting, delivering uh, vaccines. OK. Oh, that's a good point. That is good. Yeah. I think Bill was a question here. Well, we're getting the microphone to Bill. I'll just say um, there's also been architecture at the international level that was trying to organize vaccination access for countries that did not have right. their own nationally right. developed and right. successful vaccines. Yeah, like, Could I you mean, two maybe mention that? Is, is that something you would look forward to having in place for a future yeah. response? I mean, both of us are, are I mean, you're an advisor to CEPI, which was run by Richard Hatchett, who's sort of the co-founder of, of uh, COVAX, and maybe the founder. Uh, Richard Danzig, I think, was, no, he was more involved in Warp Speed. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was, you know, in 2009, it was so, the delivery of vaccines to the rest of the world was not good, uh, and that was seen as a problem. Richard Hatchett was then in, uh, the National Security Council, I guess he was still there. Yeah, I, in fact, I know he was. Um, he then went to DARPA, I, excuse me, BARDA, yeah. and then he went to the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, and he anticipated, the, the, didn't anticipate the pandemic had already started, uh, and he basically, as I say, had some conversations with uh, several people, uh, and COVAX was the result. COVAX has been, you know, somewhat of a disappointment. Uh, not surprising that you get something off the ground that had never existed before. Uh, it didn't deliver the numbers of vaccines that were initially contemplated. Right now, the problem with vaccination is not one of supply. It's one of delivery. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of vaccine out there now. Uh, you know, a lot of it is going to waste. Uh, and, you know, Africa is, is one of the prime problem areas for vaccination. A lot of it is simply because people figure they've already been infected. Uh, and, you know, you know, you have to maybe leave work to get vaccinated or maybe lose a day's pay or more than a day's pay, depending on where you are and the distribution system. Uh, I would say they're both really important areas for future investment. I think a risk is looking at COVAX and saying it failed and not investing in it in can, the future. Can you briefly remind us what COVAX is? So it's a multilateral procurement mechanism. It's an advanced purchase commitment. So what it does is it creates demand, um, which gives industry confidence that it's, they can start to manufacture, develop something and manufacture something at risk because they know it will be bought. Um, and that's important 
it, it was important in a pandemic, even when there's global demand, because there wasn't enough capacity. But it's especially going to be important if we have a smaller scale outbreak, because they really won't want to participate. You know, Merck made no money off of the Ebola vaccine, and you know, Sanofi backed out of Zika and West Nile for a variety of reasons. It's very, very fraught. So. It's an important thing to have. Um, they didn't have money in the beginning, so it wasn't they couldn't get out in front of uh, companies negotiating, doing bilateral deals with other countries. But if they had that money right from the get-go, the power of an advanced purchase agreement, agreement comes from doing it in advance. So then it works. So let's not forget about what it can do and just how important it will be going forward. And it's especially important, not just because we'll get these vaccines developed, but it allows for needs-based distribution as opposed to going to the highest bidder, which if you're trying to stop a pandemic, you want to be able to go directly where it's needed most to stop chains of transmission. So it's a very powerful idea if it's properly supported. Um, but as John said, you know, that's only one half of the coin. You can have all the vaccine in the world, but without bolstering healthcare delivery systems around the world, you won't be able to deliver it. Um, even if there was 100% vaccine acceptance rates, you still can't deliver it. Yeah, so well, we have to do that. Also to give COVAX uh, credit, I mean, one of the important things they did was seed money uh, to a lot of companies, serious dollars, real money. Uh, to get them, you know, started. Uh, you know, the advanced purchase was was very important. Took a lot more money, but they almost played the role of uh, of Barta, or, or not almost. They they kind of did mm -hmm. uh, play the role of Barta mm -hmm. um, initially with some companies. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill. I think you have the last question. Um, it, it, returning to Michael Lewis and premonition. Um, he makes the point that public health officers, uh, at least in, in his experience, have a lot of power and a lot of authority to uh, dictate policy uh, or practice. Uh, it's just a public policy question. Is it uh, a public health officials? Uh, do they hold um, uh, some answers to this? Uh, if you give them the power and authority to um, to uh, take action, is there um, a, a potential solution in uh, this realm? Okay. Well, it varies state by state. In yeah. California, the local health official, uh, yeah, they have a lot of power, uh, as, as Michael wrote. Um, I don't know what it is in other states. Uh, there's at least 20 states, I believe, where legislation has moved limiting the power of public health officials and limiting a governor's power. Uh, in Louisiana, a, the state which is in session as we speak, the, moved out of a committee a bill that criminalizes asking someone their vaccination status. Criminalizes it. So you've got, you know, fortunately there's a Democratic governor who's going to veto that if it ever gets past him, and hopefully the craziness will fade in the next few years. Uh, that would certainly, if done right, would help solve a lot of problems. But as probably everybody in this room knows, because you're interested in this issue, you know, there's been a disinvestment for several decades in public health. You know, why are we getting, making decisions based on studies in the UK, which has an incredibly good data collection system, or, you know, they came out with remdesivir just from, you know, very quickly, uh, or Israel. You know, we don't have the data in the United States. Uh, you know, that's, that's nuts that we don't have the data. Uh, you know, when you start investing in public health, I was pretty optimistic 
a year ago that public health would get investment for at least a period of five or six years, maybe 10 years or so, people would forget. I've been incredibly disappointed that here we are still in an Omicron wave, and already there's a fight in Congress over a, a plan that has funding proposal that has already been cut in half, more than cut in half. So, Just to amplify that, there are over 500 bills in state houses right now looking to expand vaccine exemptions. And a fair number of them relate to childhood vaccinations too. So this, this has really activated, you know, created a base for anti-vax activism and giving them and they're politically active, and it's going to have an effect. Well, so we'll have. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> on that <Sorry>. note. So, <laughs> um, but let me come back. I mean, you also have spent time on an issue that you might have nightmares about, but you've also laid out some really clear ways forward. You know, you talk about governance. You talk about the power of both individual and institutions. Kendall, you're ready for your call. And so you've done this before, John. You know, we're talking about operational systems, testing, uh, setting up leadership, I don't have your whole list. But it does sound like this commission is worth some attention and energy, particularly if you are only two of, what, 20 people with your level of knowledge and expertise who are committing to work through this set of problems. So perhaps um, we can end on a more optimistic note that, yay, there's a planning commission that could become <laughs> stood up, and you're asking all the right questions. So thank you both. Please join me in thanking them.